Traditional physical on-premise servers is way cheaper than going into the public cloud, right? At least that's what everybody tells me. We migrated to Azure and it was really expensive. So just because it's cheaper, is that the right choice for you? And to be honest, is it actually cheaper? Today we wanna go on-premise versus public cloud, break it down, compare the cost, compare the security, the compliance, the reliability and the performance, and hopefully that'll help you make a decision as to what's right for you. My name's Chris, let's get into it. Before we get into breaking down the costs, let's just quickly clarify what we're talking about when I say on-premise and public cloud. So for years, what we did is we bought physical server equipment and firewalls and switches, and we set them all up in racks in a server room out the back somewhere, and we put air conditioning in there, and hopefully that all ran great. And then along came the big public cloud service providers. So we're talking about like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, where they basically do the same thing. They buy a whole bunch of servers and they set them up for, they set them up in their data centers for you and you can consume their services from their data centers and it's a public cloud. This is the first thing that people seem to ask about or maybe they've migrated workloads to the cloud before and they have this notion that it's very expensive. So what I wanna do is take a look at a real world quote that I've recently done for a small to medium business, physical on-premise and compare that with the equivalent compute requirements in Microsoft Cloud and break that down. So let's jump over into Excel and take a look at the actual quote. So this is an actual quote that I don't wanna go through all the product numbers and the details, so I'll just summarize what's going on here. It's a, essentially is two servers and some shared storage and some Microsoft licensing, making this a traditional cluster, suitable for a small to medium sized business. On this cluster, we're probably gonna run somewhere between eight and 15 workloads, depending on the size of those workloads. We've included Microsoft licensing and the extended support costs for the hardware, as you typically would, and on the flip side of that, on the public cloud side, what I wanna do is jump over into the Azure calculator and basically scoped out 12 virtual machines of the same size here, two CPUs, 16 gigs of RAM, and I've also given them a half a terabyte managed disk each. And what that's gonna do is basically consume 80, 90% of the resources on our cluster, imagining that we're gonna consume 80 to 90% of the resources on our cluster from day one, which obviously is not typical, slightly crude comparison, but it's gonna suit our purposes nevertheless. So I've exported the Azure price calculator into this handy spreadsheet. And you can see our monthly cost here of $3,563.66. So let's do some simple math and just multiply that out and we've got our answer, right? So here we are, we've got our physical servers across five years. Of course, we had the original cost, 120,000-ish, $508.79. We've got our monthly cost in Azure here. And if I multiply that by the 60 months across five years, $213,819. Wow, okay, so we're almost $100,000 more expensive in the public cloud than we are by buying our physical servers on premise. So it's an absolute no brainer, unless you consider the additional costs of setting up the physical hardware. So what about the power? I've done a quick calculation based on the current price of power here in New Zealand and running those servers for at $480 per month for six years is gonna cost us an extra $28,000. And we also need aircon in that room. So I've just really accounting for aircon for the, the summer months, not even running all day, but it's gonna cost another $11,500 given that now all our critical business workloads are on premise, I think it's sensible to have a, a backup or failover internet line, and you certainly get that redundancy connectivity in Microsoft. So did a quick Google and found a business connection for $116. So running that for another five years is an extra $7,000. And conservatively speaking, the scoping of the equipment, the design, the unracking and boxing and stacking and implementation of the cluster, I think is gonna take best part of a week at a, a very reasonable $200 an hour, which is probably an underestimate. It's another $8,000 to actually get the kit installed before you can even run a single workload. So now we're costing $175,000. Okay, interesting. Things are getting a bit cheaper, but hey, we're still like nearly $50,000 more expensive in the cloud, right? Now I did allude to the fact that it's unusual or it'd be very unusual for you to set up a cluster and deploy all the workloads to it and fully populate that cluster to 80, 90% of the cluster on day one. Uh, but if you did know that you had all those workloads uh, ready to deploy and you were gonna run that for the duration of the lifetime of the cluster, then if we're gonna do the equivalent in Microsoft or in Amazon or whatever, there's commitments that you can make in terms of the amount of resources you're gonna use. So quickly show you that back over here in Edge. So if I know that I'm gonna run this exact virtual machine for the whole time, I can use a reserved instance, but a lot more flexible, if you will. So I'm just gonna use some resource. It doesn't have to be the exact same SKU. I can apply a savings plan here for one year. So if we apply a savings plan year over year, every year, then we're gonna drop our monthly price down to this number. And if we're gonna to commit to at least three years and there's no five year option here, then we're gonna drop our monthly price down to this number. So if we jump back into our Excel, that makes things a bit more interesting. 
So if we add our one year savings plan in, now our five year cost is $171,000 more or less. So we're actually now cheaper to be in the cloud. So that begs the question, what if I commit to three years of that compute? So now we're spending $144,000, so we're way cheaper to be in the cloud, and we have the flexibility to scale up and scale down if we don't actually want those servers. Whereas if we are in on-premise, of course, we've bought the physical hardware, we're stuck with that amount of resource. If we don't use it, we've already paid for it up front, and if we need more, we have to buy more. Okay, so security and compliance, a super exciting topic if you're a, a geek like me, but for most business owners, so boring and only crops up when they're trying to engage with government contracts or a certain a company that wants, wants security. So I do want to briefly jump over, I know it's probably boring, but I want to briefly jump over and just show you Microsoft's compliance documentation, and I'm not actually going to jump into any of this, but I just want to show you the sheer amount of compliance standards that they're meeting and getting actually getting accredited for, for the platform itself. And when I say the platform, with the comparison to the on-premise scenario, this is the, the cluster that your internal IT team has stood up, or your local IT provider, and hopefully they have provided all the security controls that they can imagine, but it is very difficult to imagine that they have built that cluster to meet all of these standards. It's very difficult to even be aware of all the controls that you need to know. Now to bring this into like a real world scenario, why does this actually matter? I just want to jump over and show you a chat that I had with a developer. I actually went down and saw him physically in person because we were going through a bunch of frequently asked questions about the application they sell. And all these questions that we're trying to answer are around security and compliance. So we were sitting in the same room opposite each other and had asked me questions such as what do we do for encryption or what do we do for prote protection of our ingress traffic and so on and you can see from our chat that throughout the few hours that I sat with him here from nine uh, from nearly ten o'clock in the morning there was a constant stream of hey let me find the, the documentation for that or let me find what Microsoft have written about that and I've got link after link after link answering these questions and it made it just so easy and you can see here like through into the afternoon that I just had an answer and the documentation to provide it that we could put into these frequently asked questions so easily so the ability to be able to answer those questions and have the documentation written for you and be confident in your answer that, hey, we are compliant, I think speaks absolute volumes. Of course, the platform security is only one half of the equation. There's a shared responsibility model here, and I just want to jump into an actual tenant. So let me jump across here and show you. So when you actually deploy workloads into your environment, you are responsible for those security controls yourself. When you're in the public cloud, so in this case, we're looking at Microsoft Azure, they have this little portal called Defender for Cloud, and it gives you the opportunity for you to layer on the compliance frameworks that are interesting to you. So in this case here, I've got four layered on, SOC 2, NIST, SIS, and a, a different NIST. And the great thing about this portal is you can see how you're doing against the appropriate controls. It might be useful if you need to get accredited in a particular standard. And where you're failing, let's take this as an example. So I've got a storage account deployed here, and that storage account should have some sort of restriction on it. So we can go into that and it will tell us how to resolve it. So this can be a massive money saver and time saver when you're looking to go through a compliance standard. Now, I'd love to show you the equivalent, seeing in the interest of on-prem versus public cloud, I'd love to show you the equivalent of on-premise, but if I deploy a traditional Hyper-V or a VMware cluster, I'm simply not aware of anything like this that exists in the on-premise. So in this case, for security and compliance, considering the controls that you're given, the visibility on how to improve that security, and the fact that the platform has been deployed with all the money and resources that Microsoft can throw at it versus what you might deploy in your internal IT team or your local IT provider, nothing against them. I don't know them, they might be wonderful, but I'm gonna go ahead and give this as a win for public cloud providers. It's really an interesting one to try and score. I really wanna just jump in and look at the biggest, baddest VM that you can deploy in the cloud. Let's jump in and have a look, and you've got, I think at the time of recording, the MV2 series is the highest or one of the highest performing VMs that you can deploy. And I wanna say, wow, look, you can have 416 vCPUs and enormous amounts of memory and SSD and huge throughput. Uh, but of course, the reality is you can buy physical servers and then specialist ASIC compute from NVIDIA and I think there is a competitor now that can outstrip NVIDIA. And uh, you can buy all that equipment. If you've got enough money, you can put that in your server room if you really want to, or in a private cloud data center. So really from a performance standpoint, I'm just gonna not award it to any to either side, because ultimately it's just about how much money you want to spend in one or the other. The benefit, of course, of being in a public cloud is you can scale up and scale down and just pay for that higher compute as you as and when you use it. And of course, a certain amount of configuration comes with those scalings, as it would if you're using it on-premise. So I'm gonna go ahead and call not good performance 
to either on-premise or cloud, um, but just wanted to demonstrate that you can get enormous amounts of compute in the cloud if you need it. Reliability. We're talking about two different platforms. It's not really apples for apples. With the on-premise scenario, we've got two nodes and some storage in a cluster. And truth be told, if it's well-maintained and well-configured, then you can keep your workloads up nearly all of the time. So you can get very good reliability out of your cluster. And it's similar in Azure. If you have architected your application appropriately, taking advantage of some of the redundancy options that Microsoft can give you, then again, you can keep your application fairly much all of the time. So I don't really want to get into the nitty gritty and say, okay, Azure is definitely going to be better or on-prem is definitely going to be better. What I did want to jump point out is one major difference. So if I jump across here, you can, you can go ahead and download this. But the difference is that in Microsoft, there is a, a service level agreement. So they do give you some sort of credit if they're not meeting their service level agreements. So you have some some guarantee there, but that's not to say that Microsoft never goes down. It certainly does. I've experienced a few outages. The great thing is when they have a major outage, it's up to them to fix it. So you get a notification, you know, this service is experiencing some degradation and it's no panic because they typically fix it within an hour or two. You can download this document. I don't wanna really bore you and go through it all, but you can see there is an enormous amount of SLAs that they publish and that might help you decide when you're deploying your workloads, how to configure them. Because if you configure them in certain ways, you get different levels of, of guarantee and you get service credits when Microsoft fail to meet those, those uptimes. Of course, on premise, if something fails, your internal IT team has to scramble and get everything back working for you. The other thing I did want to point out from a reliability standpoint is in the public cloud, they have data centers all around the world. And even within any given region, they'll typically have three data centers sort of separated by a few hundred meters. So you can easily configure your application to have availability across different locations or even across different geopolitical regions. So there is like global load balancing options where I can have something in the UK say and I might have the an, another workload of basically doing the same thing in, in Europe somewhere and we can load balance or fail over between them and that gives us a completely different a redundancy picture and a lot more options from an architectural standpoint. So from for that reason, from reliability perspective, I'm going to say that the public cloud fairly much wins that battle comfortably. Just a couple of final thoughts. I know it probably seems a lot like I've, I've really pushed the public cloud and Microsoft Azure here and touted how great it is. Now, there are a couple of things that might mean regardless of all that, even if your preference is to go public cloud, there still might be some reasons to go on premise. So potentially there's no Microsoft Azure region in your country and you might have some data sovereignty requirements with some of your contracts that you do. So perhaps the data just has to live in your country and you simply can't go to Azure. I'm based here in New Zealand and we don't have an Azure data center. Although I understand that New Zealand North is opening finally in, in I think four or five weeks from now. So it'll be great to start getting more and more of our workloads and clients into New Zealand North. Can't wait. Another potential consideration is if you have a very, very sensitive client server application where your perhaps your client is on your user's desktops in your office and you've got a server or SQL backend and you simply can't have even five milliseconds of latency because it's so sensitive, then perhaps you can't have your servers in the public cloud and you need to have them at your head office. Or equally, if you have physical devices like maybe scanners or perhaps you know scales to weigh things that might feed into a database or feed into your application, then potentially, depending on the application, you may have to have your servers on-premise as well. And those are absolutely valid reasons to go on-premise. But for me, and I must admit, I'm coming at this from a very biased standpoint, full disclosure, I'm a Microsoft Azure architect. So obviously I, I do like the platform. I've taken my career down that path for a reason. Just wanted to call that out as well. But hopefully this has helped you make your decision with what's right for your business. Until the next video, catch you later.